In Chapter 8 of Tim Harrower's Inside Reporting, we explore the world of digital journalism. We will start by looking at some similarities between print stories and the web. Learn how to navigate online news and use social media. We'll then move on to blogging versus journalism and writing for online media. Will electronic news sources eventually replace what we affectionately call dead tree newspapers, the traditional print product? This data from journalism.org shows that newspaper circulation rates for both daily and Sunday editions isn't looking great. Even so, it's unlikely that the newspaper will die out completely. People have been heralding the death of radio since the invention of television, but more than 90% of Americans aged 12 and up still tune in to AM or FM radio at least once a week. Likewise, newspapers are likely to survive in some fashion. Online media offers readers more variety and control. You can access the stories you want, when you want. Text, photo, audio, video, animated graphics, databases, and interactive elements can be packaged into a website to tell stories in a myriad of ways. As we've already talked about this semester, long blocks of gray text is just one way to tell a story. And based on your story, it might be better told via a video tutorial, a photo slideshow, or an interactive graphic. Stories, images, and digital extras can be linked to build story packages and give readers a true multimedia experience. Online news sites link related topics in layers, rather than putting them side by side as newspapers do. As a result, navigation is very important on any newspaper's website. In Harrower's examples in the textbook, he shows that the print product uses a large photo to catch the reader's eye, while the web uses a smaller image. The current design trend, however, is for larger photos, more like those found in the newspaper. Let's take a look at two versions of the same story from the NC State Technician. The one on your left is from the printed newspaper. It has a large black and white photo followed by a headline and three columns of text. On the right is the online version of the story. There's still a large photo, this time the color version, with the headline above it. The text follows, but is formatted in one column to make it easier for online readers. The online version also contains a second image, which you can access by clicking this link here. Because the internet is not only limited by the physical space constraints of the newspaper, the online version of a news article can include more information than the original print version. The web creates an incredible opportunity for journalists to move beyond the printed word and image and create a full multimedia experience for its audience. Web stories can include audio, such as sound bites from the recorded interview. If you're interviewing a band, you can embed an audio player from the band's SoundCloud or Bandcamp account. Video, such as highlights from a sports game or a play that you're reviewing. Links and other places to get more information about the topic. Now here's a pretty simple example of incorporating multimedia in a story from the Raleigh News and Observer. It's a brief article about Garner Scotty McCreary and his remake of a classic country song with a video to the performance. As consumers, we view social media as a social network, a way to connect with friends and family, or even to make new friends from around the world. Journalists use social media a different way, as an information network. Journalists can use social media to report via crowdsourcing. That's asking social media followers to become sources, 
by submitting information about a newsworthy topic. Now, this really isn't all that different from the person on the street interview, in which you ask a random person about a topic. At least this way, you guarantee that the source will actually have an informed opinion on the topic. Now, social media can help before you write to come up with a story idea, while you are writing to help crowdsource eyewitnesses and other key people to interview for your story, and after you publish the story to continue the conversation via online chats and behind the scene photos, video, and commentary. Harrower offers seven reasons journalists should use social media. First, it's where your audience is. You might not pick up a printed newspaper every day, but you probably checked Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any other number of social media platforms at least once today. If you are delivering the news, deliver it to where your audience is. It's an easy, effective way to cover breaking news. Let's use the example of the star football player being injured during practice from our textbook. Now, you don't know much, just that quarterback Pierce Deer has been rushed to the hospital. You can fill in the details later, but that's breaking news, and that means you need to get it out quickly. Once you've gathered more information and written your initial blog post about Deer's injury, you can use Twitter to link to your publication website where your readers can get a fuller version of the story than the 140 characters. Social media also extends the shelf life of the stories you produce. People can come across your social media post at any time and click on the story link, getting them the information they want. Now let's assume Deer recovers and is drafted by a big college team the next year. You can then reshare the full story of his heartbreaking injury later to help get even more views. Moving to reason number five. Social media helps engage with your readers. While print journalism has always had the letter to the editor, how many people have ever actually written one? And if you had a question about a story, a letter to the editor wouldn't really help you out. With social media, your readers can ask a question and have it answered, sometimes within minutes. It's a two-way conversation. Social media can improve your reporting. As I already said, social media can help put you in touch with more and better sources. And finally, it will improve your writing. There's nothing like Twitter to teach the art of tight writing. Well, there's obviously some exceptions. If you can't fit your lead in a tweet, then it's probably too long. If nothing else, constructing a tweet helps you get to the so what of your story to convince readers to take the time to learn more. But with great power comes great responsibility. Some news outlets share their social media passwords with reporters. And if that happens, you need to know that you can generally relax your journalistic style in social media, but never your standards. Fact check everything, just as you would for a print story, before you hit send. Don't publish vague rumors or retweet things that may or may not be true. You want to know your newsroom policies. Some news organizations want you to tweet the minute something happens. Others want you to wait until there's something online to link to. Now, different organizations also have rules regarding whether you can friend or follow sources, how to correct mistakes, and more. Here are links to two social media policies if you're interested, from NPR and the Associated Press. I encourage you to click on both links. Finally, engage with your readers, but keep conversations calm and civil. Now, if you're doing a good job as a journalist, you're bound to make someone angry with your reporting. Don't get into long public fights with a reader that may make both you and your news outlet look bad.
One way for nearly anyone to become a journalist is to create a blog. It's quick, easy, and free, and an excellent way to add viewpoints that might otherwise not be heard. So who creates these blogs? Again, anyone and everyone. News organizations have also jumped on the blog bandwagon and use them to tell stories that might not otherwise make it into the printed product. Now, some blogs are run by journalists who follow a specific beat. WRAL.com employs Faye Prosser to run its Smart Shopper blog, shown here, which is a collection of coupon and sale notices to help its readers save money. They also send out a daily email with the blog posts. Now, individuals who don't work for any specific news outlet can also run blogs, like Duke alumna and former Durham resident Lydia Simmons, who runs the music blog Sunset in the Rearview. So how do blogs differ from traditional journalism? They're typically shorter than traditional newspaper stories. As there's no news hole to fill, they can be as short or as long as the writer wants. Some of those smart shopper blog entries, for example, are little more than there's a new coupon, good through a specific date. Now others are much longer pieces about how to get the best prices on your week's groceries. They often have a much more conversational style. It's the blogger writing specifically for and to the readers. Now posts can be made more quickly, which also means they might contain more errors because they go through a less rigorous copy editing process. They can also include much more opinion because again, there might not be a copy editor around to ask questions about whether the story is fair and balanced. But is blogging a form of journalism? Yes, as we already learned in the Obsidian Finance Group versus Crystal Cox court decision, it is, like it or not. Before delving too deeply into online storytelling, it's important to understand how to use these new forms of news delivery. Now, print is great to explain what your story is about. You can use multimedia, photos, audio, video, and graphics to show. Whether it's a map of road closures or photos of a prize-winning pig, they can show your readers things not as easily conveyed through text. And finally, interactive features can demonstrate and engage your audience. Your first option for online storytelling is multimedia. Now this can include audio and video on a news event, webcams and webcasts, podcasts, and animated graphics. Next are interactive elements. These might take the form of live chats, of reader comments and feedback, online polls and quizzes, keeping in mind that the results won't be scientific, and downloads of additional resources. And you can also provide links for even more resources. Now this can be your own archive of everything your news outlet has ever written about a certain person, or websites that can give the reader more biographical or historical data, editorials and columns such as two opposing viewpoints on a proposed change to a school policy, or any number of additional story elements, like recipes for healthy snacks, or forms that you can fill out to update your voter registration record. Great online packages don't happen overnight, so it's important to plan and collaborate to come up with the best possible product. Start with the online package planning guide in your textbook. It's a lot like the one we went over a few chapters ago for the ant story, but with more elements, it becomes a little more complex. Assemble a team and ask them what the story is really about. Summarize it in 25 words or less. This will help you focus your package. Then think like a reader. How would you want this information presented? How will you answer the questions that your readers will ask? 
Get organized. Your online package will have a lot of moving parts and you wanna make sure everyone understands their role and their deadline. And finally, distribute copies of the online package planning guide to everyone on your team so they can keep track of their progress and that nothing falls through the cracks. We talked a lot about multimedia and interactive elements this lecture, but remember the basic to any story is still the text. You will likely need to rewrite the print version of your story to make it more user-friendly for an online audience. First, chunk your information. Now a chunk is the 100 words or so that fill up your computer screen. Luckily, journalists already tend to write in shorter paragraphs, so this won't be quite as difficult. You'll want to tweak your type to make it easier for a reader to scan. Use subheads, bullets, lists, and boldface to make it easier for them to read on a computer screen. You'll need to rethink what a story is. Keep using print to explain, but add multimedia elements to show and interactive elements to demonstrate and engage with your audience. Most importantly, try to avoid shovelware, text lifted directly from a print publication, essentially shoveled onto a website without adaptation or enhancement. As Herrer says in the textbook, the web is smart. Shoveling stories online is dumb. 